All right. So uh, welcome back, everybody. It is my pleasure to moderate our keynote address today by Pakul Patel. I've uh, known Pakul for several years, uh, and it's always wonderful to share a stage with him, uh, even virtually. Uh, he is the newly appointed Chief Digital Health Officer of Global Strategy and Innovation at the FDA Center for Devices and Radiological Health. Before that, he was the founding director of the FDA's Digital Health Center of Excellence. And before that, he was a director of the Division of Digital Health at FDA. But regardless of his title, he has always been the person at FDA focusing on digital health. Um, and not only that, for almost a decade, he has been an important player in the International Medical Device Regulators Forum, which is a collaboration among almost a dozen regulators around the world. And he has led a committee on software as a medical device. Uh, so it's really great to talk to him and to, to have him answering our questions today. So please join me in giving a warm virtual welcome to Bakul Patel. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you for those kind remarks. Uh, great. So um, let's start. Uh, if you could tell us about your new role at FDA and how it differs from what you've been doing the last few years. I'm happy to. First of all, can you guys hear me clearly? Great. Um, Nathan, thank you for this kind introduction and, and um, so honored to be here in front of you all. Um, my new role is actually uh, a really interesting and bold move by CDRH, which is Center for Devices that really takes on um, and gives, gives sort of this focus on health equity and equitable access to healthcare, um, number one. And number two is really puts an important sort of on, importance on global strategy that includes international collaborators and international regulators, not just the regulators, but also sort of stakeholders. So as you can imagine, that's more than a full-time job. Uh, and I, you know, I was given this opportunity to sort of take on that and then focus my energy there to really move the needle on health equity and how digital health, um, with, with sort of all the experiences that I've built so far, how can that be used to really advance health equity? And that, that's in a nutshell. Yeah, so we had quite a bit of discussion at our earlier panels this morning on using digital health to not only address health equity, but being mindful that algorithmic bias doesn't compromise the results. And you've spoken recently about the promise of digital health and meeting people where they are. Can you say a little bit more about that and how the FDA is making that happen? Yeah, a couple of threads there, right, Nathan? I think you can imagine uh, technology such as wearables and such, before we even get to AI and ML, you can just talk about how ubiquitous consumer technology is now becoming part of health technology. And as, as that happens, or as that has happened in the last few years, last like or several years, um, your healthcare is getting increasingly connected to people where they are. Um, in fact, um, just something something to sort of be really proud of is FDA in December of 2021 published a guidance on digital health technologies and use of, use of those technologies in clinical trials or clinical investigations. And that's to the attestation that, you know, when we start using those ubiquitous consumer technologies in, you know, greater um, sort of use uh, of clinical trials and clinical investigations of medical products in general, not just devices, but drugs as well, um, you now open up a entire population that could participate in, in those trials. And that's like one string we can just, uh, thread we can pull on and say, that's one way to sort of provide access. So again, and then sort of that leads to the second point that you are making is data generated from that um, participants in those trials now can be used to sort of draw bigger and better insights through machine learning and software to sort of you know understand more about how how our products that we regulate that FDA drugs and our biologics and our devices 
uh, can really be generalizable um, to the population that, that we are part of. Yeah, so, so to bring our audience up to speed and to connect the dots from this morning a little bit, we've been focusing a lot of our discussion on the use of AI to help diagnose and treat and inform clinical decision-making and patient decision-making. One important thing the FDA is doing that Bakul just mentioned is using AI to speed up and facilitate clinical trials. That includes for drugs, vaccines, other medicines. And so this is something we haven't even touched on yet. And we, we could spend a whole day talking about just that use of AI. So let me, let me go up to 30,000 feet for a minute here. Uh, you've been at FDA a long time. Can you tell us during your tenure at the agency how the agency's internal expertise and resources and personnel on software engineering and machine learning and AI and those types of things have improved? Because we, we think of FDA as including a bunch of chemists, biochemists and the like, who are able to evaluate drugs, but we don't often think of their technical expertise in other areas. So I'm curious, given your, your long tenure there, how the FDA's internal capacity has changed over the years. <laughs> Great question, but actually really, really an important question, Nathan. I think when I started in 20, 2008, um, we, we did have engineers, we did have people who understood software, but not, not a whole lot, right? I think it was not ubiquitous. It was a pockets, a, a very strong, deep pockets of engineering expertise that exist, and you could count them onto your on your two hands, um, the number of people that are out there. And of course, with when you have that small number, you can't reach everywhere. And so what happened was, um, ten years ago, even the 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 submissions coming in, uh, maybe I would just make a guess at this point is like fifty percent of them had software and and 50% did not have continuing software. And that has shifted in the last 10 years completely. Like pretty much every device that we, we regulate today has software. On the, on the flip side, I think computer-aided diagnostics and radiology have been a very strong field for a very, very long time, like beyond those 10 years, right? It's like 30 years um, that's been sort of going on. So we had people who are really, really worst in in radiology, imaging, um, sort of aspects of um, aspects of computer software. Now, when you take that uh, uh, and fast forward it to today, um, not only we have diversity in people with understanding the technology, um, but also understanding applying what they knew already in radiology to other areas. So that's sort of one one dimension. I can tell you just in within my group. Um, we, I started off as a single person and then I added like a couple more people to my team. Um, now we are at a team of 22 people focused on digital health, really understanding um, and diving deep into some sort of aspects of policy, aspects of you know, technology, aspects of like bringing other parts of the agency together as well. So yes, we have grown. Uh, I don't know what percentage that is from 10 to 22, it's almost 200% like growth from, from where we are. So that's just within CDRH. I can also say there's a huge focus on the internal infrastructure for FDA as well. And the, the chief technology office um, at the FDA commissioner's office level have also added technical expertise. Um, and we are leveraging all of that. Like the, it only brings AI ML sort of experts to that, to solving data issues as well as sort of insights that FDA already has from um, from the data it already collects and has. And now with with the user fee commitments in um, Center for Drugs, there's there's already a push for people to start thinking about, you know, hiring people with this technology expertise and leveraging the center of excellence for tapping into the center of, uh, to the technology expertise. Yeah, so when when industry thinks about getting involved with FDA and when scholars like me talk about the propriety of FDA being a key player or a gatekeeper for these technologies, it's very much our opinions are very much formed by what we think the agency is capable of, 
what we think they do well and what we think they don't do well. So it's heartening. I know the FDA is out there a lot interacting with industry, but I think it's an important message that the FDA is building and has built its internal capacity and expertise. So I, I, wanna, I wanna jump to a few questions about the digital health action plan and some things that the FDA began under Commissioner Gottlieb that I think are very bold and represent pretty important experiments in how we regulate medical products. So I wanna ask you first about the digital health pre-certification program. And this is an experiment where the FDA is saying, look, we're gonna pre-certify certain companies. And if they have a culture of quality and have processes in place, we're gonna allow them to bring digital health products to market more quickly and, and on an expedited basis versus companies that aren't in this pre-cert program. So can you update us on how the pre-cert program is going so far? Yeah, and um, it's, a, it's a really, I mean, near and dear to my heart because that's something that I envisioned and sort of created this from ground up. Um, it was definitely an experiment, like you said, and I think experiment has sort of shown, and we are sort of at the tail end of the experiment to conclude and say, you know, this concept is valid. We do this in different forms ex already today. However, to do it in a very consistent way, we probably need to bring on new authorities for us to sort of legislatively for, F for FDA to sort of use those mechanisms to efficiently sort of get, get products to market. Now we have, we have some challenges with today's, today's uh, system, uh, the 510K systems and, and sort of the way we sort of approach things they're really looking at, you know, moving away from this episodic, you know, go to market and then come back to us again when you change something that's significant, um, and then we'll review it again. I think the what we propose in the experiment is we need to know uh, what the capabilities of the company are, how well they can manage risk, how well they can sort of maintain sort of the safety and effectiveness performance profile, etc. So we we worked with the companies, the the nine pilot participants, and plus some others who raised their hand to help out, and and we we found that most of the companies already do these things. Now the challenge is going to be setting the standard for reporting to FDA, so we can we can translate um, big, small, you know, multinational versus versus other sort of dimensions of companies um, to sort of be reporting in a very standardized fashion to FDA. And that's sort of the next level or next step needs to happen. So we, we've seen individualized, like, I mean, we've spent time with, with companies and say, let tell us how you're doing. We can sort of gauge their capabilities. Now, because it, it was an experiment, we were not legally allowed to sort of put products through market through that pathway, but we paralleled it and tried to experiment it in the shadows of the, our current pathways to see if that can, that can validate. We learned a few things. We learned, that the excellence appraisal model works or it can work. And there's a little bit more work that we did need to be done to make it scalable. We also know that if we look at um, the product itself before it goes to market um, in, in different, different lens, with a different lens, taking into account the capabilities of the companies we can be more efficient in how we look at the products. And the third piece, of, which was the most important piece of the, of the experiment was, how do you sort of incorporate real world evidence into, into the uncertainty of a product being authorized to go to market? That's, that's number one, right? So I, I believe there is a little bit more work needs to be done there, um, especially, uh, when, when we started talking about that concept, we said products needs to be instrumented to collect real world data. And then when you, when you click on that and so, sort of expand that tree of what is real world data, you start seeing you know, multiple aspects or streams of information that are being collected. Some are easy to collect, some are really hard to collect because it's not in the domain of the device itself or the software itself because the outcomes were really downstream of a patient getting better. And, and we feel like when, once we need to close those gaps. Um, and I feel like there's a little bit more work needs to be done there. But I've, but overall, I think we are at a point where we are saying the, the concept is viable. 
we need more work to be done and but we can't do it in our current paradigm and we need to we need to sort of start thinking about what flexibilities fda can have to regulate something like ai that's going to evolve over time and 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 really really be responsible as a federal agency as an independent sort of oversight agency to maintain safety and assur assurance of safety and effectiveness yeah so you're it's an excellent answer and it raises a bunch of different points i'd like to jump into one point for the audience is that a lot of people don't realize that agencies need freedom to experiment themselves and that everything they try isn't a fully formed idea that necessarily can be implemented legally right away. And you mentioned that the that this is a policy experiment and that the FDA might need new authorities. And when you say the word authorities, the lawyers and law students in the audience think of statutes. So do you, and, and the FDA is, is one agency that has been particularly successful at turning its internal policies and programs into statutory authority at, at convincing Congress to codify things the FDA is already doing. Um, do you see this happening soon? I know that the FDA has user fee legislation uh, on the calendar that Congress considers periodic user fee legislation. Is this something you think Congress might take up in this next round of user fee legislation? I don't know. I can't, I wish I could predict that, but I don't know whether that's, that's, a, that's on the table, first of all. Um, and I think user fee and the entire process, legislative process is, is much more complicated from our, our lens and our sort of perspective uh, from the, any federal agencies, not just ours. Uh, I think it's just like really complicated. Uh, I think there is there's a general recognition that 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 something different needs to be in place. Um, but however, I think a much more conversation needs to happen before we can I, we could sort of all agree on like what that legislative authority should look like. So um, your answer also triggered a, a question from one of our panelists later, uh, Glenn Cohen from Harvard, who you've, I know you've uh, interacted with before. And that's about using real world data to review products. Can you talk a little bit more about that? So if we're talking about you know, AI programs, if you train a machine learning algorithm based on you know, images and data sets, how do you make sure that those conclusions and that logical process translate translates into something that's clinically meaningful and clinically valid. So it's it's an interesting question, right? And and I don't think it's a unique answer for AI ML. And and I say that because that's sort of the bar that we have for all products that that we authorize to go to market. So I think we we don't expect just because it's AI or machine learned um, uh, product or a solution uh, or a diagnostic or a detector, um, it shouldn't it shouldn't be clinically valid. So the answer is we absolutely need to need sponsors and manufacturers to sort of show that it has to be clinically validated. Now what does that mean, right? I think you you, you can start off with the initial part of what data do you have? What what does it represent? What population it represents? So it's a it's a clinical study just flipped on data uh, as opposed to clinical study trying to get data to build build their algorithm, right? So it's it's there's lots of you know if it was ten thousand foot level from the actual making of a product, those principles, those requirements or expectations for people to prove that it works. It works as design and it works as intended uh, to be used. Um, still, are are there? They're not. They don't go away. For I mean, very really tangibly, I can say that you know, you, you can't really mix up testing data or validation data with your training data, right? You just don't can't do that. You can't, um, or, or it just becomes I mean, experimentally flawed for that matter, right? Uh, and then, can you for then if you have a claim? around that product saying, I'm going to do X, uh, does, does that doing X really valid, is really representative of your validation data? I think those kind of, those questions do, uh, do matter. And then the clinical validation part, I mean, I mean, let's use uh, some, somebody who's going to read and read a report, for example, for a radiology report, 
we want to sort of see similar to what people do without AI ML uh, or using just image processing um, to do inter-rater reliability studies or some sort of rater reliability studies to do the same function. And I think those, those expectations don't go away and I think they're still valid. Um, just because it's AI ML, I think you just have to, st you start off at a different spot, but I think, in fact, I was just having a conversation this morning with a bunch of regulators across the globe and we were just talking about we not we don't think we have a different expectation because you're a machine learned sort of system versus a, a experimentally based uh, uh, algorithm that's sort of um, that sort of gets to the same answer. Yeah, uh, thanks for that. So that raises another related question about you know maybe the finish line is the same for AI products and non AI products. With machine learning products, one meaningful difference is that they can change a lot more quickly than a physical device can change. And one of our panelists at, at Oculogica earlier asked about how the FDA is accommodating these the capabilities of machine learning systems to change. And you know, I had a separate question about the change in control plan that yeah. uh, the FDA has talked about. So can you talk about you know, if we have a heart stent or a hip implant, those things don't change on the fly, or yeah. we hope they don't. Um, they're physical devices, and it requires a lot to change them. With a machine learning algorithm, they're built to change. So can you talk about the change in control plan and how the FDA accommodates these more dynamic product updates? Yeah, so we proposed a idea in 2019, and another sort of concept said, you know, if manufacturers or developers can pre determine predetermine areas that they anticipate changes because of data availability or just you know anticipated learning or the trajectory of the learning um, we would want to sort of get in agreement ahead of time so we know how those changes are managed right I think the the con we know that changes are going to be inherent to these kind of products but if we had assurance that this changes, are managed in the, in the right way, in the right risk, sort of the same concepts of risk management. Can you can you maintain the safety and the performance profile of the product, um, and and not let it degrade, but only enhance? I think we want to sort of we wanted to get that assurance ahead of time, and and get going going back to a piece a piece of the puzzle from the research program is can you sort of do ahead of time so we can sort of get get you to market and not have you come back for those smaller changes. So that's like, so they're intent. Now, of course, we had to put boundaries around, right? If you can, you, you can't change an intended use from intended use A to intended use B because you're authorized to operate within those bounds. You're authorized to sort of, your claims are made to be um, what we authorize you and we're allowing you to sort of evolve better within those bounds, right? So I think it's just, if your performance is increasing over time, that's great. We all want that. Um, and, but how are you going to manage degradation is really what we wanted to see in the change control pro protocol. So we, we've sort of done this um, in, in a couple of cases, as you, you guys may have seen some of, the, some of the authorizations that we have. But I think there's are very limited, right? I think if you really think about um, how do we get special controls in place, that allows people who come through behind their first de novo um, application and maintain the change control protocol and manage it in a, in a responsible way. And that's kind of what we have been sort of trying out. Now, again, I think we could we do more? Uh, yes, I think if we had different authorities to sort of manage that better, we could do more. But I think within our current authorities, we were, we were just being creative to sort of answering the demand of the question you just asked, Nathan, is like these these products are designed to change, and how do you manage that? So we said we can let you. However, you have to be responsible in how you do it. Um, the analogy that comes to mind is you know you can go to a bowling alley and some people put rails up on the side so you can't gutter ball. You know if you have a young kid with you, is is that kind of what the change control is like, or is that too simplistic? <laughs> Um, yes, it is kind of. So you avoid, you avoid the ball going into the gutter. I think that's, that's sort of the, 
That's an analogy. That's like perfect. I haven't heard that analogy before, so <laughs> it's good. Um, an another another big experiment in the FDA's plans is the use of third parties to review these products. And again, it's based on the perfectly rational idea that the FDA doesn't have a monopoly of expertise here. And you might have really sophisticated third parties who are able to evaluate these products in a more uh, expedited fashion if companies need it. Have companies been making use of this? And, and what are the preliminary results of this experiment? So I, I, I don't know all the details about that, so I, don't, I won't pretend to know. Um, but I'll tell you, I think that program was something that, were, that was built, experimented about maybe two Madufas ago. In the last Madufa cycle, the user fee cycle for people who don't, don't know the acronyms, the user fee cycles uh, uh, the last five years, I think they were revisiting sort of what, what guardrails, what expectation we should set on the third party reviewers. Uh, because we did see some, the, some, some disconnects between sort of what was expected and what was what needed to happen. And it ended up sort of, instead of increasing efficiency, in some cases we saw a decrease in efficiency. And I think that's, um, that's sort of the, the leveling that was going to happen. I don't know exactly where they are right now, but I think it's a program that's been under under sort of revisit as we speak. Yeah, I could be completely wrong, by the way. But yeah, that's kind of what I've heard last. Um, another question I've been asked to ask you from one of our panelists is, to what extent has your team been involved in actual product reviews? So for 510Ks or the de novo applications, when companies are asking for FDA to give their blessing to a new product, is, is your digital health team involved in these reviews? Do you provide input? Are you just an observer? Um, actually, the last two. So we provide input and we are also observing. So in the initial Q submission process, we have been often asked to participate, um, sometimes bridge the tra bridge and translate what, what sponsors are saying, sometimes there to just learn where where things are heading and what issues there are, there are being sort of raised. And I think we work behind the scenes with, with the reviewers to sort of provide input and guidance and consistency in policy applications that we, we have sort of established for, for, the, for the center. So I think it's, and then lately, I think we have also been asked to be as a consultants to sort of help with the reviews itself, where certain, certain groups may have expertise in house and certain groups may not. So I think we do, we do sort of fill in that gap. So um, you've spoken recently about how a lot, of, a lot of digital health companies are really embracing the science in the area and looking to bring to market evidence-based products. And in a lot of my classes on regulation, I talk about how a lot of regulation boils down to incentives, creating proper incentives to meet standards, creating disincentives to veer from those standards. Creating evidence-based products can be expensive and time-consuming and burdensome. So how, how does FDA maintain the incentive for companies and innovators to generate evidence-based products, to generate sound science that proves their products do what they claim to do? Well, I think our work in publishing guidances and, and explaining people what's expected, and not this is not just very digital health focused, but just generally, I think, and being open to experimentations with with ideas such as real world evidence and ex expansion of claims is, is sort of getting people to start seeing that you know, there's value in getting an, an authorization from FDA and not to just be in the, in the non-regulated space. Um, also working actively and working, um, working with people who bring in DINOs, uh, especially in the world of digital therapeutics where where there's new ground to be sort of um, formed. Um, I think that shows a sign of encouragement for people to see that it can, it is possible to get through FDA. It might be, um, it might be difficult, but it might, the difficulty is more about, you know, what you expect your product to do versus what you can prove your product to do. And I think it's just very, 
in, in my mind, I just equated to that simple equation. It's like, if you may dream, the product developer may dream to sort of solve a lot of problems, but if the product itself, because of whatever the reasons are, lack of data, lack of time, et cetera, may not be able to show that it actually uh, distinctly say they can do whatever that function that they want to do, then they have to sort of think about what can be done today and what can I prove it. Or, or and I, I usually have a slide which talks about you have to match your your what your product does to what your product can do, or what your product, what you claim your product to do with what your product actually does. And those two parts of the equations should line up. And once you line that up, I think that's sort of that's the evidence generation, right? Because FDA will never tell you to go now. You you are too low of a, a bar. You should go do more. That's not the point. The point is more about you know you should be equal in terms of your claims and your your capabilities of your product. That's not, so. Another thing that you know we recently did is published a list of products that have been authorized, and and AIML is like one of those one of those examples like of list that we published. That also shows people that it's not just me, me as a developer being in the vacuum, trying to see, trying to figure out whether I can go to market or not. Um, and I think when people see, I, I truly feel like when people see those lists up on FDA's website that being published, uh, I think I feel like there is there's probably a push towards, yes, I can be a a product that's similar to that, that I can fit under that product code and I can learn from what, what this other product has done. So I feel like that's those are sort of mechanisms that we use um, in, in directly or indirectly because we are not a paying authority. So we, we have to use our own tools to encourage people to come to, um, uh, come, to uh, come to market. Yeah, and I think the, the FDA has done particularly well at trying to demystify the process. To be honest, Drug and device approvals are mystifying. That whole process can be mystifying, particularly for an industry that's not used to regulation. And uh, the FDA has been over backwards to try to clarify its authorities and what's required. Um, I, I want to shift a little bit to your international work. So you've been heavily involved in the International Medical Device Regulators Forum, and you've worked over the past several years to create a common set of definitions and nomenclature for artificial intelligence, machine learning. Can you talk a little bit about your work and how some of this standard setting might set the stage for more harmonization internationally between regulators? Yeah, I think the body of work we did um, on software as a medical device, I think that has been as if you literally look at each country, I mean, Japan, UK, now uh, European Union uh, and the commission uh, that represents EU, uh, Health Canada, Brazil, they have all been using the software as a medical device vocabulary. And I, I think that's just very satisfying to see uh, at the very minimum, a, manif a maker of a product that's making in country A can literally walk into another country and use the same terms, and it they won't be looked upon as with with surprise, right? I think that's sort of the first intent. The second intent is uh, with the risk categorization that we put on, we put 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 forward as part of their work. Um, it's been a fundamental sort of disconnect between manufacturers of technology and individual regulators. I think the the creation of that that document um, sort of even though it's not perfect, I'll be the first one to admit, it's not the perfect document where you can draw very sharp lines. Um, we wanted to, I think the goal for that effort was to try to get grounded on all the things we agree upon, or at least start off with a place that we can, we can agree upon. And I think there's lots of edges that need to be sharpened, but I think that's a different story. Um, but I've seen every, a lot of jurisdictions are sort of taking to adopt um, experiment, experiment implemented, and we are trying to figure out like how can we sharpen that even further in the next go round. So I think that's something that we are going to think about how how to do that. Um, I I can um, I, I, and you know this. I think five years ago the word software as a medical device didn't exist, and now everybody uses it. 
um, either to market their services or either to sort of sell their, their products or label their products as such, uh, which is fascinating. And I think that's sort of the one, one thing that we could, we could say that harmonization has sort of really driven sort of that, um, that sort of common vocabulary. Um, I also want to ask about a document uh, released in October last year, and that was a series of 10 good machine learning practices. And that was co-published by FDA, Health Canada, and it, their counterpart in the United Kingdom. Can you say a little bit about the motivation for that and why those three regulators got together? Because I know they're all part of the International Medical Device Regulators Forum. It was notable that you had 10 kind of concrete principles, which, you know, frankly, make a lot of sense. I'm just curious what went into that and, and why now? Absolutely. I'm happy to share. It was, it was another experiment. Um, it, um, so uh, just a bad, sort of the behind the scenes sort of uh, work that happened there was we, we well, backdrop, and for the last few years, um, and most of you guys may know this already, is there is pockets of work on machine learning being happening in various, various, various sort of settings. Uh, every time you turn around, you see, uh, start seeing people actually either building a coalition, building a working group, or working on things that are very adjacent to each other, or sometimes even overlapping. And, and there was really lack of, like, everybody wanted to work on things on machine learning but but they all saw the problem from a very their own perspective so that's like the first problem statement two that seemed to be i mean there seemed to be lack of direction from any one body to say these are the areas that we need further work on that was sort of the other part of the motivation so just chatting informally with um with uh, mhra um, uh, with the, which is the UK counterpart for medical device regulator. Uh, it, this was just an idea that emerged. We said, why don't we put out a principal uh, document limited to 10? Um, I would have loved to limit it to five, but I think we couldn't do that. Um, so we limited to 10 to fit on one page. There was a limit. So guide people to sort of take on these 10 streams of ideas or 10 streams of principles that could be worked upon. The whole I, the motivation was if people coalesced around, you know, these 10 things and, and there were 10 bodies working on 10 different things is much more productive than actually, you know, 10 bodies working on one thing. Um, and I think that was the motivation around that. And then as, as you saw in the document we laid out, we said, look, there might be standards, not just in our industry, in, in health tech, or health health sector, there might be standards in other industry, there might be work happening in other industries, bring them together because these are the important things that we feel as regulators are important for products that are brought to us or brought to healthcare system. And we happen, so we coalesced, we aligned on so the stand principles. Um, obviously you can imagine like lots of wordsmithing went into it, but I think it was easy to sort of do it with the three three regulators um, as an initial step for us to sort of see whether we can publish it. Amazingly enough, we were able to, you know, do this and publish it together, which was one, one of the first feet that we really rejoiced and sort of really thankful that we were able to get it out. Um, and it showed sort of a alignment in, in thinking uh, of not just the problem set, but also the solution sets that, that existed within the three regulators. Um, and we are we are looking to sort of I mean it, it was not meant to be exclusive uh, to these three group um, but it was just a matter of logistics trying to get people aligned um, as you can imagine if the same document were to align with like five more regulators you can just multiply it five factorial the amount of time it would have taken so I think it was just a matter of like that right balance to hit. Yeah, and the, the title struck me. So when I see good machine learning practices, it makes me think of good manufacturing practices, good laboratory practices, which we know are codified. Can someday we expect to see these good machine learning practices in the Code of Federal Regulations or perhaps U.S. statute? I don't know. I don't know. That's, an, that's a to-be-seen kind of scenario. Uh, 
but you you probably saw a recognition of common sense good manufacturing practices also built into the same thing i think data science it may be maybe unique but not so much unique to um, to what we have been sort of expecting people to do for anything like it's either you know medical devices or software or you know drugs or biologics so i i, I don't know whether we need to create a separate sort of set of requirements but i think connecting the dots to existing requirements with this expected good practices would probably make a lot more sense great so with with the time we have left i want to give a chance for the audience to ask questions so we have a question on the chat from uh, francis shen at harvard medical school he says dr patel thank you for being here i don't know if you can see this or not uh, you've spoken about the importance of advancing access and equity. FDA has clearly stated that understanding sex differences in medical product development uh, and so applied to AI and machine learning, it would seem that a model intended for general use but only trained on males would be problematic. Thinking about artificial intelligence and machine learning and race, assuming that no developer would intend that its product be used only by one racial group, wouldn't all product developers need to ensure racially diverse training data as well? Wow, that's a long, long question and probably many threads in there. So let me just try to attempt to answer some of them. And I, I'll just pull on this, right? It's more of a, I think this is more of a conversation, right? It, as we sort of embark on this journey of health equity, I think, you know, as, as Francis points out, um, there is, there is this, this balance between intention of a manufacturer or a developer towards the need of the population. And as and when I say population, it's, it, you know, I want to include every sort of this uh, sort of um, diversified sort of inclusion that we would want. And so and within that, there is the way I think about there is the desired state of where we need to be versus what's available from where, what we can do. And when I talk about what's available, it's like the data availability, right? If you start thinking about, you don't have data for whatever reasons, for a certain group of population that um, that you, even though you desire, you can't really find that data. Um, how do you sort of, how do you sort of break that hurdle, right? You just, on the flip side of that, I would say, I would argue that we just don't want the, um, the existing sort of availability of data drive optimization only for certain types of population as well. So I think that's the thread we are trying to trying to sort of uh, pull on and see what incentives, what mechanisms we could sort of put to put in place. How do you say raise awareness? I think in my mind, I think about you know know your biases first um, on your data sets, understand where you're lacking look for or fill the gaps of those data sets for those uh, for those population that once you know, you know where your gaps are so you can you try to fill it as the best you can, optimize it for the populations that you have data sets for and not claim to be generalizable, but our goal is to be generalizable, right? For all, for all in the US. So don't leave people behind is sort of my message as opposed to you know, try to just make it for the data that you're available. I think you can be really, really lazy and just say, I'm just going to work on the data I have. Oh, I just happen to have data on this type of population and not others. And I'm just going to work with that. There might be some incentives um, in, uh, from a data accessibility perspective that you may want to sort of explore and think about how do you sort of, with the goal to being generalizable to the all, all population types, how do you sort of have a plan towards getting that? How do you have a mechanism towards filling those gaps would be something that we would want to encourage. Great, thank you. All right, so we have a few minutes. Let me open it up to questions from the audience or, or people joining on Zoom. If you have a question on Zoom, uh, please post it in the Q&A and I'll relay it. Uh, do we have any questions here in person? Let me check the queue.
Um, so we had a question from earlier uh, about the role of race and data sets. Um, as medicine is going beyond a race-based understanding, such as removing the race component from uh, EGFR, uh, that's epidermal growth factor receptor, I think, uh, what's the role of race in AI? Has there been evidence for or against the role of race in data sets besides dermatology? Should, should we change this language to indicate geographic distribution? Um, I don't think we're ready for that yet. Um, I think we do, uh, I think if we have to sort of understand even physiological differences between different races, and we all know um, different populations groups exhibit different things at different times and at different rate. And I think, um, I, I truly believe in uh, that we have through all the trials that has happened in this in this world, um, there is information to be sort of garnered from that, but we're not there yet. So I I don't think we can just simply just remove the the focus from that and start start leveling towards sort of more generalizable sort of uh, sort of area. So I think there until we are beyond that point, I believe we would still we would still want to start understanding, knowing the differences. And once we know the differences, we can sort of go down to the, you know, in, in machine learning, the deep learning method of saying really what really matters here as opposed to what's been symptomatic or what's been shown on, on, on the surface. Great, thank you. So I have a question from uh, a, a panelist, uh, Nicholson Price at Michigan. He asks, how is FDA thinking about homegrown systems developed by hospitals and health systems in house? Oh, the great question, and it's probably right in line with with the law students here, as we start thinking about how FDA uh, draws the line between practice of medicine versus versus manufacturing, right? So, or commercial distribution, is to be the to be exact. And I think um, I know Nicholson. You probably know the answer to this very well, as 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 I do as well as. Uh, I think FDA does not regulate practice of medicine. I think uh, in our mobile medical apps guidance, we we went a little further and said um, group practice does maintains that maintains the physician patient sort of relationship uh, would not be something that we would we would regulate. Um, the question about in-house hospital or in-house homegrown systems to be used in a hospital, I think it falls in that gray area. I think that needs a little bit more clarity. Um, and I think we all have to be responsible, right? And I mean, if you think about if somebody, I mean, I'm not saying this is equates to AIML or the solutions that are grown in, in home, but it, in stents, a, a, a mecha or mechanical system that's implantable in, in a body, even though it's homegrown, I think there is, there is a legal slash responsible way of using it and in multiple patients. So as we start exploring and getting closer and closer to the boundaries of where does commercial distribution begin and, and stop, I think that's sort of, that will sort of help us sort of guide this, but I don't think we have a crisp answer for that yet. Yeah, and it, it kind of reminds us of the problem of laboratory developed tests, how there's been this back and forth where FDA is regulated and then says they're not regulated. And that confusion was magnified during the pandemic uh, you know, hospitals developing their own lab tests and using those in-house. You know, obviously you cross the threshold if a hospital develops something particularly useful and starts commercializing it, marketing it, marketing it in interstate commerce. Um, we have a follow-up question from Glenn, which is, which is uh, essentially gets at the, the same issue and uh, Glenn and uh, recognize the overlap. Um, uh, are there any other questions from the audience? I have a question from uh, one of our students. I'm Mr. Patel. My name is Ruan Mankies. Can, can you hear me on this microphone? Yes. Perfect. Um, you touched on this a little bit in one of your, your first answers, but I was wondering just for some of us that just don't quite have the, the, the same level of just technical proficiency with what we're talking about, when, when we're having these conversations about making sure that we don't have biases in our algorithms um, and trying to make sure that we're calibrating it correctly, as we go through that process, are there any dangers um, as we try to build those in that, that can cause clinical accuracy to decrease as we're trying to adjust to make sure we are actually not having biases there. What, what's the, 
what is, is there a blade that cuts the other way as we work through that process? Certainly does. I think, uh, I think we want, I mean, at, so I'll be at 20,000 foot and then we'll come down lower. I think at 20,000 foot, you can just say that, yes, you're absolutely right. If you like tweaking and optimizing it for all, I think your performance goes down. But I think one of the one of the nice things about machine learning is you can start optimizing once you start collecting data in that one particular domain. So you can imagine if it's a spectrum from that goes across, you can see different optimization peaks for different types of subpopulation or or some of the different types of areas that you want to focus on it. And it is multidimensional, right? So I think you can just say on one dimension you can talk about you know population type. Then another dimension you can start talking about location of where that's where it's supplied, right? So if you're if you're applying it to rural Alabama versus you know New York uh, New York New York City, I think you have a very different profile of population that you can optimize to. But at the, at the very minimum, we we need to make sure the the algorithm or the or the software that is trained at least performs to some level that can that can sustain across the spectrum, right? So that's sort of what we are talking about here. All right. Well, this has been wonderful. I want to thank Bakul for his time. Like I said, he is he has been the person in digital health at the FDA for as long as I've been studying it. Uh, so join me in thanking uh, Mr. Patel for speaking to us today. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you all for listening to me. And uh, that'll conclude our keynote. We are going to reconvene uh, back in Hillcrest at uh, 1.30, I believe, for our third and final panel. So thank you.